Okay. So I'm Alistair, as you've probably already gathered. I work for AOC Archaeology, but this is pretty tied off my back, this research, so it's a bit of a misnomer to have AOC's logo on there, but, you know, legal reasons. Right, so. The digital world is one of representation based on the abstract use of binary numbers over a computer-based network. We treat the digital as we treat the real world. So perhaps we can frame this essay that I'm going to speak to you for the next 15 minutes about as an offshoot of what is really real and not just visually there. Yet archaeology is uniquely placed to utilise the digital, namely to reconstruct the past. So, what is the ontological difference between an interaction with an archaeological object in real life and one based in entirely in the digital domain? Are we addressing this challenge? Through a philosophical framework, I will analyse this question through Jostemol's full characteristics of the digital world, and by relating this to archeolo through archaeology using photography and photogrammetric models. Humans struggle to visualise the scale of the digital. To quote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, space is big, really big, just mind-boggling, hugely big. You just won't believe... I'm sorry, I <laughs> screwed up. I mean, you may think it's a long way down to the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Traditional analogies do not tend to work for the digital for a variety of reasons. Yostemol proposes a better analogy for the digital realm is space travel, as, they, as both the digital realm and the spatial realm contain temporal and spatial characteristics which, do not, uh, which are not seen on planet Earth. For example, if we are recording the session, hello, we can... We can watch this session later in the future, and you can watch this session from Mars. However, this analogy falls down for a number of reasons. The main one, though, is that you can do some of these tasks with analog technologies rather than just digital. But one of the characteristics of outer space travel is that it's so vast, we cannot really comprehend it. In the same way, the digital is so vast, we can't really, uh, we can't really visualize it properly. So what I propose to do is use the dice as an example. This dice here, you can only have six results from it because it's only got six sides. However, if each side of this dice had a digital display, you could, in theory, input any number you wanted into it. And it could have an infinite number of representations on it. So even though it could have all the numbers in the world inside it, it's still this size. It's still tiny. But the scale of what it contains is infinitesimal. The digital makes it possible to make the abstract real. In the same way, when you look up at the stars at night, there are an almost infinitesimal number of stars out there, and yet you can only see a number of them. Could you count all the stars out there? Most of them you can't even see, but the digital makes it possible. Thus, we should similarly approach digital archaeology, particularly online. Archaeologists have already highlighted the importance of using the digital image and contribution compared to an analog method, showing how important it is to have an archaeological illustrator to capture the complexities of a site. However, many studies have focused just on the visual critique of the digital, not the underlying ontology. To balance this critique, I would like to propose the uh, Mold's analysis of the digital, and his four underlying characteristics he's identified are the multimedia, interactivity, virtuality, and connectivity, and I will analyze each of these in turn. So multimediality is a combination of words, images, and moving images and sounds. Digital information is, in its simplest form, a binary code. The digital media can then be transported and replicated easily, which puts objects out of their original context. Everything on this screen you can see can be translated into eight binary numbers, which can then be coded into 256 different linguistic signs, which can then be then used in any program that can read a binary code. How well it will work is a different matter. Aidan even sees multimediality as an abstraction as well as the manipulation. By capturing information in binary form, you are divorcing the processes of the digital from the temporal and spatial peculiarities of our reality. In fact, even go so far as to say that this is the defining feature of the digital, as all digital information is superseded by and becomes one or zero, everything or not everything. Multimediality's most common function is manipulation, which isn't a purely digital characteristic, I would argue. To illustrate my point, one of these images here is the raw image, and one of these has been edited for the 1938 edition of the Picture Post magazine. And with the image on the left is the one that's been edited, edited to save the young woman's dignity there, uh, because they had, at the time, their standards were you could not have, possibly have that photo on there. 
but nobody was told. So the image on the right was one that was used and told to the public that this, is, this was the raw image. It's effectively an early Photoshop image. However, analog technology falls down in this respect because it cannot combine visual senses with other senses without resorting to other media. This is where the binary code makes a digital difference. It allows all the senses to be used at the same representational platform. In this respect, multimediality creates an e easier interface between the digital and humans. I will come back to this point later. The picture post image also demonstrates that the media become unstable as they are in flux. The analog and digital photographs may look the same, but they are not structurally identical, as photogrammetry encompasses both traditional photographic methods and digital imaging. Yet these media are technologically and fundamentally different. This leads to a common criticism of digital archaeology, and that is decontextualization. This is a serious ethical issue that concerns the ontology of the dataset. Multimediality allows us, or a computer, to Photoshop an image without us noticing the difference. The second of the most characteristics, interactivity, focuses on the way in which the user navigates through the digital. If humans will interact with computers in new ways, then we should investigate the ontological issues involved as well. In this case, interactivity is best described by hypertext, a nonlinear network of fragments which, uh, through which the user can navigate. Unlike a book, where the author has put the words in a set order with page numbers and so on, you can intervene on the web page or any sort of digital medium at any point you like. There is no need for the page number because the referent is the text itself. Evans argues that this is a significant break from the analog media as the numbers then become secondary to the text itself. In a computer game, likewise, you can determine the outcome of the game itself. You can try and do this in an analog world, you can try and create your own rules in a ball game, but it becomes a bit complicated. The point is here is that the viewer, in a sense, becomes an author within the work. It becomes very phenomenological. The original author then simply becomes a creator of narrative spaces that allow multilinear paths to be taken within it. Other definitions of interactivity, which there are many, only occur when the audience actively participates in the control of an artwork or representation. Such an example is crowdsourcing. The photogrammetric model can have multiple contributions of photographs from a variety of authors and a variety of sources who are contributing to the final product. We see such active examples in the world. The one I'm going to use is Google Earth, because you can see photogrammetric models all over, uh, all over the world based on real buildings. However, there is no rigorous way of us, as people outside of Google, of rigorously checking whether these photographs are real, for example, or how accurate they are, or what uh, particular hardware they use to capture those final images that make up the final product or whether there is an overall grander strategy for why we're doing this in the first place. Conceptual models are also used in this data to fill in gaps in the model, say, for example, rooms on certain buildings where it's impossible to get a photograph up there. These are entirely created in digital medium. I would argue that these are true proxies in our reality, as there's no true basis in reality for them. So in whatever form interactivity is taken from, the viewer becomes an author in the digital realm. So now I'll move on to possibly the most controversial part, is virtuality. Here it is concerned with, to quote Heim, an event or entity that is real in effect but not in fact. In computer sciences, reality and virtuality are considered part of the same continuum. A virtual world is a simulation of a world which is not real in a physical sense, but its effects across as real. Think of nausea from flight simulators, or the stories of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, from drone pilots uh, fighting in the army. Virtual reality takes multimediality one step further by becoming the interface that humans use to access the digital. However, the consequences for archaeology are far-ranging. Western philosophy has traditionally made a hierarchical composition between being and illusion, but the digital subverts the opposition because the digital image is created from reality, becoming the representation, but then it is then used to judge reality, creating a positive feedback cycle where the representation can gain more credence than the, re the original it was based on. We are at the risk of falling into this trap if we over-rely on the virtual. What about virtual entities? For example, personal assistants who, like in the worlds.net, people represented as historical characters within that. Jeff Buchan argues if we, that if we see reality as a purely phenomenological experience, then augmented reality is any change in the totality of our sensory and cognitive experience that is produced by some form of technology, via addition, manipulation, or deletion, thus augmenting reality, like wearing tinted spectacles, for example. The definition excludes hallucinations or illusions of what is created by the mind, but is not real. If virtual entities are modelled on people or objects, what happens is that you question whether the virtual reality 
is a different entity from the thing it is modelled on, or whether there is only one entity. If we believe the latter statement, there is only one entity, then you accept that the recording of said entity is the actual entity, that the actions of the virtual entity are also the actions of the real entity, contradicting the idea that augmented reality is not a reality but a change to the totality. I know, try and keep up. If you believe in the former statement, there are two distinct entities, then you encounter issues of what is natural, our reality or the virtual entity, especially if the latter does actions that are not considered natural to the former. This becomes particularly problematic for us, as it is impossible to psychoanalyze the dead. How can you say that a real person would have or not done that action in the past if you never observed them doing it in the first place? There are no principles in defining what is considered more ontologically natural. This argument creates a form of skepticism that ultimately questions the base of reality itself. The, some, this is something that Buchner ultimately, ultimately denies, as he believes the image is simply a pictorial representation of an entity. Note, however, the creation of multiple identities in the digital realm. For example, all the social media profiles that you may have online and whether they have contradictory information about them. So these individuals may not necessarily see your actions in reality in the same way they do with your online presence. What about your printing your virtual model in a 3D printed model, which is based on the numerical representation of an object in a virtual environment? This is then converted into a model through a separate process. At what point can you accept the model as the representation of an object or a site. By creating a model, you are effectively creating a unique creation. So every copy, in a sense, becomes an original. Therefore, copies are not true representative of the original work. But what does, does this mean for the biography of the original as well? Moreover, digital models are often made separate from their spatial and temporal environments, which often contain the titles that is useful for the contextual information of that original model. However, this is not to say that copies should be completely ignored, as they're they have their own uses too. But nonetheless, in the digital, the manipulation of the image has taken precedence over the exhibition value or cultural value of an object, which are both central to how we display and interpret archaeology. So what's all the consequences for this archaeological data? If our aim is to record the world as it is, then we may reflect on Paul Cripps' statement that information that goes into databases is far too perfect and far too often a perfect view of the world. This is interpreted as our methodologies of data collection by being flawed, by being too representative. We are seeing what we want to see. This is difficult to quantify as we are extrapolating from incomplete data sets. And in archaeology, of course, we often lose the information before we can record it. So it becomes a catch-22. However, by using the digital realm to record our world, we are creating a new world, not just a copy. This is reflected in the modern postmodern dialectic of the mimesis poesis, the idea of recreation of, of an object versus the creation of an object. The computer is traditionally seen as a modernist ideal. Nelson Goodman argues that an analog object is impossible to differentiate in a finite manner. It can only be absolute in a continuum, like a thermometer. A digital computer's strengths lie in giving definitive readings and repeatability. Can scientific methods in archaeology be used to create new worlds rather than just recording them? Our raison d'etre is being a steward of the past, which seems to be a modernist ideal. However, interpretations of archaeological features are often multilinear, even though we are only trying to record our supposedly unilinear world. This multilinearity is arguably a form of oasis. So not only is the digital realm giving us the space to record our world, but this recorded world is a new world altogether. The final characteristic, connectivity, links everything we do within the digital realm through the medium of the internet. I will quickly go over this since I realise I'm running out of time. As mentioned before, digital models are decontextualised, but this might lead to a scenario whereby you're going into a, a virtual excavation through a school trip, and without the expertise of an individual to guide the children through, they might start reciting Hamlet with the virtual skulls. Is it ethical, just as ethical, to allow them to play Hamlet with the skulls if they're virtual rather than just the real ones, for example? But what about the children start exploring multiple sites at once through a virtual reality simulator? This positionality allows us to explore multiple sites in multiple time frames, or potentially visit multiple conferences and give multiple papers at the same time. Could our bodies, are our bodies ready to withstand this sort of punishment in the digital? Even today, some of these scenarios are possible. So, to conclude, is there an ontological difference between analog and digital models? With apologies to Douglas Adams, the digital space is big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way to the computer, but that's peanuts to digital space. The abstract is made possible and apparent. The digital work does not work to our laws, and it should be treated as such. All information is either everything or not everything. Although the digital is pure representation, the characteristics of multimediality decontextualize everything you record. Interactivity makes participants more of an author within the work. Using 
nothing more than human interaction and representation of reality becomes the yardstick we use to judge reality itself, creating a positive feedback cycle. You can break out... It becomes difficult to believe that historical characters within a virtual reality simulator. You can break out of your human limitations and attend multiple parts of space and time in the same, in the same situation. It will feel real, and yet your body is still situated within one body. Although perhaps the most devastating outcome of this uh, research by Yossi Moll that he never really reflects on is that whether we are actually using the digital to record the past or creating a new past for ourselves. We are creating new worlds altogether that seek to enhance human experience through the digital medium. This dichotomy of recreation versus creation is perhaps the question that will come to define digital archaeology in years to come. It all feels real, but it should not distract from the abstract of the nature of the digital. And I thank you for listening.